The backbone of the internet relies on huge undersea cables that span the length of the world's largest bodies of water, and recently two cables were severed in the Baltic Sea that connect Finland to Germany and Lithuania to Sweden within 24 hours of one another. And given how rare it is for a ship to break one, let alone two undersea cables in a row, it's suspected that somebody did this on purpose to sabotage those countries' ability to exchange data with one another. Now, if you aren't familiar with fiber optic cables, they transfer data as pulses of light instead of pulses of electricity like ethernet and older phone cables do. And this allows them to transfer data much quicker because for one, you can't get any faster than light speed travel, and at the endpoints of these undersea cables, which are basically big data centers that the cables from your ISP and phone company ultimately route to before their long trip across the sea or the ocean, the hardware in those data centers uses a technology called wavelength division multiplexing, which allows multiple colors or wavelengths of light to be sent over a single fiber cable and then get received and split back up or demultiplexed on the other side. So this allows the undersea cables to carry many terabits per second of data at the speed of light with minimal signal loss because the single mode fiber cables that are used for these undersea connections can carry data for about 100 kilometers before the signal needs to be boosted again. The only real downside with these cables, other than the cost, which is still just a drop in the bucket as far as most government spending goes, is how fragile fiber optic cables can be. Because the cores of these cables that the light passes through is made out of glass instead of copper, like ethernet, so even bending it at a sharp angle is enough to render the cable useless. But that fragility was taken into account before these cables got laid out in the oceans, so unlike the fiber cables that you would see coming out of the backs of servers and data centers, these undersea cables have multiple protective layers that are made out of steel, aluminum, polyethylene, polycarbonate, and other materials that protect the cables from almost anything that the seas could throw at them. Now, of course, bombs, lasers, grinders, and other demolition tools could very easily destroy these cables, but that kind of sabotage would be way too obvious. You can't just deploy some shape chargers right into an undersea cable and try to convince the countries that that's gonna affect that you just made a big oopsie. But if a foreign cargo vessel were to drop its big ass anchor onto the seafloor and drag it for a few hundred miles, then you might just be able to convince someone that that was an accident. Like, oh no, our anchor just suddenly dropped dropped off of the boat and it happened to sever one of your critical communication lines. That's probably the kind of excuse we're going to get from the people that were working aboard the Yi Peng 3, which is the name of the Chinese bulk carrier ship that was operating around the undersea cables at the time that each one was damaged. And the ship was also photographed later on with damage to the anchor's flukes, which you can clearly see here that they're twisted at the tip, so they probably hit something. And there's locator data from the ship available that shows some suspicious activity about six hours after the ship crossed over the first cable. The ship's AIS tracking went dark for roughly seven hours, this solid yellow line on the map represents when the ship was actively being tracked by AIS, and the dotted yellow line that you see here is basically an estimate that was made by the tracking system after the fact for how the ship might have traveled based on its positions before and after the ship went offline. So the tracking system is basically assuming that the ship just kept going straight on its course here. And when that tracking came back online, the ship had only traveled about 78 kilometers, and so it would have had an average travel speed for that time of about 5.6 knots. And then about six and a half hours after the second cable was severed, the ship stopped in Danish waters for a little bit and drifted around for just over an hour, and then continued back on its way. And this actually did get picked up by the AIS tracker. 
you can look at marinetraffic.com or other marine traffic tracers to see this for yourself. So people are speculating that during this time, the ship actually stopped at some point during the AIS downtime. And of course, we actually saw this unexpected stop here after the second cable severance. And during these downtimes, the ship might have been winding its anchor that it dropped back up, which would explain why only two of the 10 or so fiber cables and gas pipelines that the ship traveled over got broken. And it also makes sense that they would wind their anchor back up if they really did drop it and it wasn't just gross negligence because obviously if you're sailing a ship, you're going to notice if you're dragging your anchor pretty quickly. Now, people might be more likely to believe that this really was just an accidental anchor failure if the exact same thing hadn't already happened just over one year ago. Last October, a Hong Kong ship called the New New Polar Bear lost its port side anchor in the Gulf of Finland and it hit a bi-directional natural gas pipeline and the EES-1 submarine communication cable between Sweden and Estonia. After China conducted an internal investigation into that incident last year, they determined that the damage that was caused by the ship was accidental and caused by a storm. Now, I believe the EU is still investigating the new new polar bear incident themselves, but this most recent Yiping-3 incident is being looked at more closely as sabotage by a lot of groups. Now, it is worth noting that there are about 100 to 200 undersea cable faults that occur in the entire world every year, and most of these faults occur in shallow waters with high shipping traffic. I believe the Red Sea is actually the one where most of the cable faults occur, uh, but I, the Baltic Sea overall has fairly shallow waters as well. So this very well could be ruled as an accident, as could the ongoing new new polar bear investigation by Western authorities. And I would think the only way to really prove for sure that this is sabotage would be to prove intent because again, anchors do fall off of boats. But like I said at the start of this video, these couple hundred cable breaks per year across the whole world are actually very rare when you consider that thousands of ships sail just in the Baltic Sea every month. And a couple more things that make the incident more suspicious is the fact that when the first cable was severed, it was in an area of the Baltic Sea that's actually pretty deep. It was in about 170 meters of water, uh, which apparently is deeper than most ships are going to release their anchors, or at least is a depth of water that is so deep that a ship would be unlikely to intentionally release its anchor there. So hopefully these cable breaks, whether they're accidental or intentional, don't increase in frequency. Service is expected to be restored to the Sea Lion 1 cable by the end of November. If you enjoyed this video, please like and share it to hack the algorithm and check out my online store, base.win, where you can buy awesome merch like the Come and Find It hoodie or the tie-dye tour tee, 10% automatic discount at checkout when you pay in Monero XMR. Have a great rest of your day.